Welcome back to the Richie Rich Chemist. A lot of you send me DMs asking me to share my career story. So here it is in today's episode. This is a part of a talk that I gave all about the different career opportunities in chemistry. But before that, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell notification. If you like the video, drop a heart in the comment section. That would encourage me to create more such content. So let's start from here because who doesn't like gossip? The sources that I'm going to talk from is largely going to to be my life's journey, my friend's stories, that YouTube channel and the internet, of course. This is me, very notorious student in school, but there has been a transition from BU being a horrible student to BSc being a bad student to MSc being a relatively decent student, I would say. After your BSc, is a master's degree really needed? If you're in a country like India, 100% yes. When you go for a job interview, your last degree is the one that matters most. Master's degree becomes your basic degree, particularly we're talking about today in chemistry. So what should you do after your BSc? Would you want to work and then, you know, do a master's or should you directly go for a master's? I want to give you the example of this one person who is on the screen here, Dr. Guru Prakash Karkera. He did his BSc, then worked for a year, understood what he really wanted to do. Then he joined master's. If you're planning to do that, then you need to take up your job in the same field itself. The second thing is, do you really need to do a master's at all? Dr. Ninad Lasrado currently doing his postdoctoral studies in Harvard Medical School. During his BSc, he did an addition research research project and using that he directly applied for a PhD program in the US and that option is available. He didn't have to pay fees because it was a research institute. They were paying him stipend. What the supervisor is looking for is the interest that you're showing towards getting into a career in research. Are you able to demonstrate that aptitude that you have is what is most important. The other option that we have in India particularly is again an integrated PhD which is a six-year program that uh, many of the premier research institutes like the Indian Institute of Science, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, they offer. What did I do? After my BSc in St. Agnes, I joined Masters in St. Aloysius College, the two years analytical chemistry course. And after that, I joined back as a lecturer there from 2010 till about 2018, I was teaching at Aloysius. First of all, why did I join teaching? I thought Mangalore was very comfortable for me. It gives you a lot of opportunities to do something more than academia. I was part of youth groups. I was in the Toastmasters Club. I used to uh, MC functions. I was a freelancer soft skill trainer. And in addition to this, I also took up coaching for CT and NEET. A job like teaching isn't as hectic as an industry level job, given that you are in Mangalore. Very often you think that teaching is just a nine to five job and then you get two months of break and all of that. In the summer vacation, you need to be preparing for the next semester, revision of the syllabus and all of these other things that go into it. So there is a lot of work that's carried back home as opposed to other jobs. While I was teaching, I registered for a PhD. It took me about over six years to complete my PhD. I was able to do a part-time PhD because I was already in teaching. Was it hectic? Yes, definitely because I had to teach in the college during the day and then stay back in the lab after working hours and, you know, kind of complete the work. And it took much longer than what I would have done if I was doing a full-time PhD. But that was the option I chose. I was not looking into a career in research in itself and that's the reason I did not want a full-time PhD. It depends on what you want to do. Do you want a career completely in research, in the lab, is something that you need to decide. How does one become an assistant professor? Basic qualification definitely is your master's. Private colleges would take you just after an MSc. But technically speaking, to be called an assistant professor, you will need to clear the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research UGC NET exam. UGC stands for University Grants Commission and NET stands for National Eligibility Test. There's also a state level exam that's there. GRF stands for Junior Research Fellowship. You get qualified as a junior research fellow. You are also getting a stipend, which is almost equal to in some cases even more than the salary that some companies give you after your master's and once you get your PhD you would get a much higher position. Now let's look at what we do beyond that. Don't always be under the impression that chemistry is just about test tubes and your lab work and lab code. There is a branch of chemistry called computational chemistry. Nevertheless you also need to understand that there is research in all fields and like we always say, chemistry is everything. So therefore, the spectrum of opportunities that are available are vast. The borderline between chemistry and physics is very fine, right? As you go to your PhD, you might probably navigate into a biology field, your physics. Uh, so these divisions is, you know, man-made. And like we say, core of everything is chemistry. One of the ways to get a research exposure as you're doing your bachelor's of science is to get selected for the project-oriented chemical education. Every year, they call for the summer internship internships that is uh, in JNCSR. If you get selected, it's, it's an amazing opportunity where you get to be in the Indian Institute of Science 
work there in the campus itself and get that exposure during a summer vacation i think you also get a small stipend what if you don't get that one because i think those are extremely limited positions that are available every year there is another one which is called the indian academy of sciences uh, summer research fellowship so please apply for that and please look up these things on the internet the best thing to do is shamelessly write to people look up the internet look up who's the professor find their email address and just write like a fan letter to them but when you're writing they should be aware that you're serious about research what you need is that exposure to get into that research place if you don't want to go there even in your own college do a research project that has some kind of an implication that really has some tangible outcome if not publish a paper if you're able to even present a paper at some research conference it adds so much weightage to your application as opposed to your marks what are some of the opportunities that are there with regard to the pharma space it is limitless pharma industry is the biggest industry in the world and with covid and all of these things coming in the the sector is only expanding like exponentially so there is marketing jobs there are government jobs there are regulatory bodies uh, entrepreneurship there are enough and more opportunities most of your classmates are probably you would end up in, in a job in the pharmaceutical industry this is again one of the episodes that i have on my channel where my own classmate ravi krishna talks about how he became a manager even without doing a phd please be sure whether you need a phd in the direction that you're going what does the industry offer you have crazy job opportunities here one is the typical r&d specialist r&d stands for research and development you can again navigate into fields like sales manager i have uh, one of my batchmate yatin whom i had interviewed on the channel very interesting job because you uh, learn new skills you get into marketing and all of that the other end of the spectrum is getting into a startup working in a startup has its own challenges it it has its own opportunities uh, if you want to know more about that you can watch that video and some very crazy careers like the one on the right is uh, the official fartologist there are people who actually sit and smell farts and study the chemistry behind that as to what food can give you what kind of fart there are some crazy careers that you wouldn't have heard of with chemistry you can just go to any extent that's there what are some of the non conventional uh, careers that are possible teach for india this is an ngo that uh, works on enabling rural schools to get good quality education so if you join teach for india they train you for a year or two and the training that they give you is really good. Good. you also get a stipend this wouldn't be a job if money is the criteria for you but you want to do something really good to society it really molds you in the way that you can even start your own school once you finish because that's the level of exposure you get online tutoring today is picking up career opportunity they really pay well as well there are a lot of these an academy physics wala and so on so you also have jobs of content creators in chemical industries every industry today has its digital marketing section so you have scope there as well if you think that your or good with communication need not necessarily be english as a communicating language you could become a freelance content creator you could start your own youtube channel do something on instagram so there is a entire career stream that you can think of as a science communicator and there are also a job opportunities in science museums there are people who contribute to science fiction movies the science comes from the scientists themselves who would contribute to these things another interesting area that is not often explored which is a uh, quite a well paying area is the role as an intellectual property agent there is an exam that you have to give after your masters and of course if you want to get into this field your exposure should be in the legal side let's say you do an msc in chemistry and then join some legal firm for a, a small internship meanwhile prepare for the intellectual property agent exam then there is a lot of opportunity today in research commercialization and research management all these research institutes require people who are managing the research as well project manager a lot of economists contribute today to science in the form of innovation economics it's not just the scientists who contribute to a science ecosystem after my 8 years at st aloysius college then i decided let me do something more challenging i wanted to write the civil services exam there are 24 posts that are offered under the civil services exam but you need to have solid preparation there again the level of competition is extremely high i prepared for it for 6 months and i wrote the exam i didn't clear the prelims and that was my last attempt possible for the general category it's 32 which is the age limit but nevertheless once i gave that exam i really is that there are so many opportunities in policy that are there beyond the exam other upsc exams that are there for geoscientists for indian forest service there is the uh, meteorologist then you have the combined different services exam there are a lot of scientist roles that are there in the department of science and technology and other institutes like drdo would have theirs isro has call for scientists and so on and they train you as you progress in that organization i had no exposure to science policy i wanted to get an exposure so i wrote to one of the 
professors in uh, National Institute of Advanced Studies. So I did a two months internship over here. Luckily for me, at the same time, the government of India had called for a postdoc fellowship. I had finished my PhD by then. So then I was able to apply for a postdoc fellowship. My parent organization was the Indian Institute of Science. They have a center called the Center for Policy Research. And that is how I got into science policy. And I was hosted for this uh, fellowship at the office of the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. This is the, the DST Center for Policy Research, where I did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship for two years. And I was also involved at that time with India Science, Technology and Innovation Policy, which was being formulated at that stage. It gave me an exposure to interact with scientists of national and international stature for scale that I had never thought about. And that is what is important, I think, in today's world to get that exposure that you wouldn't get otherwise. So I got married after that and I had to move to New Zealand because I was involved in the formulation of India's policy. One of the chapters there was on open science and open science is an area today that is a part of science policy. When I had to move to New Zealand, I worked one year remotely as the campaign manager. It's a France-based NGO called the International Science Council for managing their global campaign on open science. So when you're thinking of a career in chemistry, don't just restrict yourself to thinking that I have to be in the lab itself. You can go beyond the lab and do so much more to the chemistry ecosystem in general. Once I got my work visa here in New Zealand, I uh, got a job with the Ministry of Primary Industry. So New Zealand is largely a primary industry driven uh, economy. Fisheries, forestry, aquaculture and biosecurity here is again very strong. So I work right now in the area of science policy. There is a lot of international relations that are there and, and that's the area of science diplomacy where you use science to build international relations. The last one that I haven't explored and this is something probably I would like to explore sometime in the future is starting your own uh, ventures. But again, please be aware whether you have the aptitude for it when there's so much of startup culture in India, uh, whether you are the right person for it is something that you need to identify. And the food and beverage sector is a huge space that's there's breweries, wineries and so on needs so much of chemistry, right? It's also food based. There's so much that's going on in the space. Everybody's buying much more than what's required and eating so much more than what we require. So this area is just expanding exponentially. With chemistry, sky is not the limit. Your mind is what is limiting it. But before you do anything, do a proper SWOT analysis of yourself. Try to understand where are your strengths and how do you capitalize it because everybody's journey is going to be so different. What are your weaknesses and how you can overcome it is something that you should be aware. What are the opportunities that are available for you because not everybody will have the same opportunities and there is no field that has got lesser opportunities or more. It only depends on where you are. Understand the threats in your own field. There is no field which does not have scope. Most importantly, don't judge yourself by somebody else's yardstick. You want to leverage the best that you have. So make the most of what you have. What is the skills that you can leverage and, and that could really help you. You stop growing when you stop learning. And today you have opportunities to learn in so many different ways. LinkedIn courses, Khan Academy videos, free courses on edX. I don't know if you've heard of MOOCs and some of them even give you certificates. The Indian government has uh, NPTEL, which again has certificate courses directly from IITs and IIMs. And because it's chemistry, please show some reaction and ask questions now. I'm sure this video has loaded you with the career opportunities that are available and you are stunned with the opportunities that chemistry can offer to graduates, postgraduates, researchers, postdoctoral researchers and anybody who ventures close to chemistry because chemistry is everything and everything is chemistry. I will see you soon. Until next time, stay hungry, stay informed.